lecture like this is an opportunity to look back and to look forward. And I'll start by looking back. Um, you'll need to forgive me for reminiscing a bit. But I'm doing it because, well, it, you know, it's homecoming. That's part of the point, right? Um, but more importantly, I wouldn't be in the line of work I am without believing that the past is a useful and necessary leaping off point for what I will eventually plan to talk about today, the present and future of libraries and archives. I came to the University of Michigan 20 years ago this fall. I was a liberal, a liberal arts college graduate who had never surfed the web and didn't have an email address when I arrived. I'd come to Michigan to become a librarian and perhaps an archivist, although I didn't really know what the difference between those two things was when I showed up. Um, and I had a vague understanding of the ways that technologies were disrupting traditional ways we communicate, and create, transmit, and store information. It was my hope that I would learn a great deal more about these new technologies and also to engage with them critically. Certainly, the education I received here enabled this and more, but perhaps in ways that were unexpected. I was not aware that I was entering a school undergoing a dramatic transformation. I was in the generation of students who entered the School of Information and Library Studies and who left the School of Information. This was a time of great excitement and also real turbulence. It was a period where one took classes that were clearly and explicitly experimental and also those that were downright traditional. I had Robert Warner's last class uh, in which I learned the fundamentals and the history and the ethics of the archival profession from the greatest archivist of his generation. And I wore a blue blazer and a, a, a Maisie tie today because that's what Bob Warner always wore. Um, his, his class changed my life because as, as Dr. Warner introduced the field to me, I, I knew I was meant to be an archivist. The next semester, I took the first course taught by a brand new professor, Michigan was very excited to have recruited. Uh, Margaret Hedstrom's electronic records course showed me how my newly adopted profession was evolving and where we needed to be going. Um, Beth Yackel was here completing her dissertation at the school and she taught an advanced se seminar on archival administration, which taught me to love archival theory. And perhaps most importantly, I was able to do internships and other work, and to, to work at the Bentley Historical Library, the Labadee Collection, and the Hatcher Library Reference Desk, which gave the opportunity to put theory into practice and, in, and to interact with and learn from a network of early mentors, including Julie Harada, Tom Powers, Brian Williams, Fran Bluen, Bill Wallach, Nancy Bartlett, and many others. So while I had an incredibly rich experience here, it was deeply influenced by the existential anxieties the school is experiencing. The future of the school and the library and archives profession felt at stake and in question. There was the group leading the school into its new future. They realized clearly that the relative monopoly on serving information and research needs that had been enjoyed by libraries and archives was ending, and that information would increasingly be created, exchanged, discovered, and stored in systems outside of libraries and archives. And they were, of course, absolutely right. They also sought to bring more scientific and social scientific rigor to the school, to make it more research focused and to expand it into new areas such as human computer interaction, information architecture, and economics. In the last year, I, I was very proud to be invited to serve on the school's external advisory board. And so I've gotten to take a, a look at how the school has transformed itself in the last two decades. It's a rare thing to see a vision so well actualized. In addition to a truly impressive research agenda, the school can proudly boast of graduates being placed at and contributing to most, if not, the, not all, of the major technology companies and to doing extraordinary work like you know, Samir talked about. The school's growth is truly impressive as well, with an ever-expanding faculty, new degree programs for undergraduates, health informatics, and other program areas. I also have to say, the part of the school with which I have remained most familiar, the archives program, continues to produce remarkable graduates who become leaders in the field, especially when one considers the fates of library schools at Columbia, the University of Chicago, and Berkeley. I'm now deeply thankful for the leaders who reimagined. So you guys all say UMSI, right? Yeah, so when I was here, we said SI. Um, <laughs> so you're going to have to forgive me for that. Um, so but who reimagined UMSI, I'll get it right once. Um, <laughs> And I'm sure I join many in looking forward to a future where we continue to marry the work of libraries and archives to the broader information and technology landscape. But at the time the school was becoming UMSI, now, now it's going to be a thing, um, 
There were many students and perhaps even some faculty who expressed reservations and feared what would come from the removal of the words library and studies from the school. Many of us had been drawn to the school in the first place because we loved libraries and archives. More than that, we believed in and quickly became passionate about the mission of these institutions. Most libraries have mission statements that hit on core functions, acquiring, preserving, cataloging, providing access. These are all important, but what really fires up advocates for libraries will be concepts like equal and free access to information, preservation of cultural heritage over the long term, service to humanity with no mind paid to economic profit. There's a classic way of thinking about one's profession. You can think of it as a job, something you do to make ends meet, or as a career, something you build over time, motivated largely by success and prestige. Or as a calling, something you do because you believe in the ability of one's profession to make the world better. Professionals should view their work in all three of these categories at various points and often concurrently. But the best professionals in our field spend the most time seeing their work as a calling. This mean, what this means is that they're concerned about the importance of why what we do, of the why of what we are doing with less focus on the what and the how. So a concern about the core mission of the school emerged at this time. Many feared that the transformation of the school, in name and in fact, represented a philosophical shift away from what was perceived as the soul of the school, dedicated to the calling of the work of libraries and archives. This was happening precisely when predictions of the demise of libraries and, library and librarianship began to proliferate. Many wanted the school to plant the flag and defend the venerable profession and institution, even as we knew the work of libraries and librarians needed to evolve. We talked about losing the word studies a lot less, but there was an important concern here, too. Implicitly, the word studies connotes an interdisciplinary approach, and within that big tent, an orientation toward the humanities, suggesting that the study of libraries' information should include a healthy measure of the pursuit of history, philosophy, literature, and the arts. I confess, here's a confession, I was a vocal member of this faction, and I reveled in a self-styled contrarian pose. Even as I was learning to hand code HTML, encode text in TEI and EAD, design and use databases, and hone my technical skills in other areas, I read deeply in the literature of the growing anti-technology movement. One of my favorite projects was a paper for Howard Besser's Social Impact of New Technologies course, which weaves situationist critiques of commodity culture with a case study of an anarchist collective in Detroit who struggled openly with the results of adopting the use of a computer to produce the newspaper, The Fifth Estate. My career ambitions remained focused on wanting a professional position within a traditional library, archive or library, preferably within an academic setting. I left the school with some truly mixed feelings. Given the option to receive the traditional Master's in Information Library Studies degree or the new Master's of Science and Information, I chose the MILS. I knew I'd been given an excellent educational experience, but I left the school with my concerns about its soul in place, perceiving it as too concerned about technology for technology's sake and, more troublingly, how technology could be harnessed for profit in areas that would carve away at the noble missions of libraries and archives. And then a funny thing happened. Um, I got a dream job as an archivist in manuscripts and archives at Yale, a position that afforded me the opportunity to learn almost all aspects of the field appraising, arranging, and describing archives and manuscript collections, reference and public services, and acquisitions and collection development. While never a techie, I quickly understood how valuable the technical skills I learned at Michigan were to manuscripts and archives, and how new technologies were changing our approaches to all of these activities and more. Throughout my career, I've encountered new generations of archivists and librarians trained at Michigan who've displayed both a firm grounding in the foundations of our field, a progressive vision for how we need to evolve and change and skills necessary to achieve new things. And perhaps counterintuitively, the further I've gotten away from my experience at SCI, the more I've learned, to, learned about and from it. And now realize that my education at UMSI, you guys are just gonna forgive me with that, within its existential moment could not have prepared me better for a career in library and archives. My education here challenged assumptions about our role in society and first forced me to articulate our continued importance. More importantly, I internalized the reality that libraries are not fixed entities and that the all too natural desire to find stability in our institutions is a fool's errand. A career in libraries and archives would be marked by how well we navigate change and not by finding a stable situation sticking with it. This was explicit at Michigan, but more was implicit. 
learning how to navigate the school during a period of transformation provided terrific training for a career in a profession undergoing continuous transition. It was here I learned what we really needed to focus on was how to bring the best and most relevant portions of our traditions forward and to marry them with new approaches that will allow us to fulfill our missions in a greater way. My own passion for archives and libraries is as strong as ever, but I do know that we need to continue to evolve in order to ensure our place in our future. So what does that look like today and into the future? As I pivot the rest of my talk to consider this question, uh, my remarks will be devoted largely to my own specialization in archives and special collections within large academic research libraries. And I should say a note about terminology. When I use special collections, I mean it in a big tent that includes archives. Um, you know, we can, we can go round and round about that if you want, but um, just that's, that's what I'm talking about. The past 20 years have seen extraordinary change in this realm, and these remain transformative times for special collections and research libraries as a whole. Not meant to be comprehensive, what follows is a partial list, both of what I'm worried about and what I'm working on, is informed by my experiences at Yale and UCLA, it will, and I, I will also give some in-depth attention to what we face at Houghton Library at, at, at Harvard. To begin, I'd like to run quickly through a set of changes and trends that define our current moment. First of all, we've seen a growing emphasis on and a higher profile for special collections in research libraries as a whole. This has happened for several reasons. Mass digitization, electronic journals, and aggregated, aggregated databases have combined to make the general collections of research libraries mirror one another more and more. So rare and unique holdings now primi primarily distinguish a research library's collections from its peers. We've acknowledged for several years that special collections are what quote, define the uniqueness and character of individual research libraries, as noted by the 2009 report, Special Collections and ARL Libraries. Connected to this, we've seen the breakdown of many barriers that used to separate special collections from the greater library. Special collections are now seeing a renewed call to align their programs, services, and operations with the mission and strategic directions of the university as a whole. The last decade has seen the profession adopt aggressive approaches to expose holdings that have languished in backlogs and to implement standards to provide online descriptions. Repositories have embraced outreach through social media and traditional means. The enabling of self-discovery of rare books, manuscripts, and archives has led to a greater awareness of and a growth in use of special collections. Although the vast majority of our holdings have not been digitized, mass digitization programs, including Google Books, Hathi Trust, the Internet Archive, and scores of commercial electronic databases and other products now provide access to the texts and surrogate images of materials once only available in our reading rooms. I'd characterize this largely as a success, um, but I should note that it's reduced use of some types of materials that uh, used to um, be used more heavily in our reading rooms, especially those where the importance of content outstrips form. Um, collections are growing in size and in complexity. This is most true for contemporary archives, which have seen an explosion of information created and recorded on a staggering number of formats and applications, um, let alone the laser printer and the photocopier, which has made paper collections extraordinarily large now too. Also for modern collections, intellectual property issues have become increasingly complex and prominent in our work, as has the assessment of privacy risk factors in providing global keyword searchable access to what used to only be available in reading rooms. Connected but external to the library, we face the perceived decline of the humanities and new questions about the value of archives and libraries within the neoliberal university. While budgets have largely stabilized as we emerge from the Great Recession, in most cases for research libraries, our budgets are still flat or growing more slowly than our costs. And this reflects a significant problem for higher education as a whole, as we've seen our costs rise dramatically and at an unsustainable rate. All the while, the great value of our collections, both financial and archival, makes the effort necessary to steward them resource intensive. For all we care about the researchers of today, special collections need to take the long view. One of the more powerful aspects of Special Collections work is the knowledge that we are but one link in a long chain of custodians and advocates that stretches backward and forward through time, doing our part and our best to make sure our cultural heritage can be preserved and understood for generations to come. So it's tempting to read the current situation as adding up to a gloomy picture. Special Collections were being asked by our universities and library systems to take on a broader, deeper, and more complex role while maintaining most of our traditional responsibilities and often with flat resources. And as I turn to a more in-depth discussion of some specific challenges, it's important to acknowledge that this is perhaps the biggest one. 
But I'd also like to suggest that things aren't all as bad as they seem. On some level, everyone knows that when you talk about challenges, they exist in a dialectical relationship to opportunities. Opportunities promote the value of libraries and archives into the future. This is the mindset I've endeavored to bring into my responsibilities as director of Houghton Library at Harvard. Although I've spent the past year immersed in thinking and learning about Houghton Library and Harvard, these responsibilities still feel new to me. When you begin a job like this, you quickly become deluged by information. There's an imperative to learn the library's history, its collections, and of course its staff, our colleagues in the library and on the faculty, and our donors, our researchers, and many of our friends. This is both an exhilarating and an exhausting process, but after a year, I'm beginning to emerge and have a clear understanding of our present situation and our hopes for the future. And using my experience at Houghton as a guide, my goal is to give a flavor of what it's like to lead such a library and to share some of what we are working on with the intention that this will provide insight into the challenges and opportunities rare book and manuscript libraries face more broadly. To set some context, I should tell you something about Houghton. As, as you learned, Houghton is Harvard's main repository for rare books and manuscripts, ranging from ancient times to the present. A description of our collections could take up the rest of my time, but we are perhaps be known best for our collections of medieval manuscripts, early printed books, theater history, printing and graphic arts, and American and European literature and history. When you visit Houghton, you can tour our unrivaled collections of manuscripts, books, and other material related to Dr. Samuel Johnson, John Keats and Emily Dickinson, each of whom have rooms dedicated to them. Our archival holdings are remarkable as well. They include the papers of Leon Trotsky, John Reed, Gore Vidal, John Updike, and many others. We hosted almost 6,000 research visits last year. Uh, nearly 3,000 students attended class sessions held at the library, and we funded more than two dozen research fellowships. Houghton is more than a library. We play a museum function as well, installing three major exhibitions a year and several other exhibitions in smaller galleries. Our most successful exhibition in the past year, celebrating the 150th anniversary of the publication of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, drew 3,000 visit visitors from 53 countries. We regularly hold lectures and symposia that relate to the collections and other issues relevant to the library, and the Woodbury Poetry Room brings distinguished poets from near and far to do readings, which we have recorded, preserved, and made available since the 1930s. We're also a publisher. Uh, we publish two journals, uh, the Harvard Review, a preeminent literary journal, and the Harvard Library Bulletin, which publishes scholarly articles that reflect and promote the research potential of Harvard Library collections. In addition to its collections and programs, Houghton's strengths include a beautiful and ornate Neo-Georgian building, a dedicated, passionate, and knowledgeable staff, strong endowments, and the support of faculty in the campus generally. Houghton also benefits greatly by being part of the Harvard Library, the largest academic library in the country. In addition to comprehensive general collections, Harvard Library provides conservation, preservation, and digitization services in a wide network of 73 libraries. Within these libraries, Houghton enjoys several other special collections and archives as partners, including Harvard University Archives, the Schlesinger Library for the History of Women, and top-ranked collections in the libraries of the Business School, Medical School, Law School, and many others. Taken together, these collections comprise a truly dynamic and sometimes challenging environment to carry out our work. Harvard University librarian Sarah Thomas recently referred to special collections as the Shangri-La of research libraries, but I can assure you that Houghton is far from a utopia. I've begun to strike upon a theme of opening Houghton as a way to articulate the work ahead of us. Houghton embodies a long and proud tradition of the rare book and manuscript library. The men, and yes, they were mostly men, who built this library and others like it, performed a remarkable service by creating collections, spaces, and services designed for the study of history, art, literature, book history, bibliography, and other pursuits. I know we stand on the shoulders of giants as we build upon this work, but we've unfortunately inherited a culture less welcoming to a broad group of potential users than we believe appropriate today. Some of this pertains to the nature of the material we hold, hold, which requires knowledge of specific languages and handwriting in order to derive meaning. But too often, the history of our institutions tracked to an elitist culture. We are now a few decades removed from the time where access to the collections of a library like Houghton required curatorial approval. 
I'm thankful to work in an, area, in an era in which we have made strides to democratize and broaden access to our holdings, change our orientation to value service and use of collections, and increasingly see teaching of others, teaching others to use them as a core part of our mission. And I have to say, when Tom said, wow, you have the whole Western canon there, um, a big part of our challenge is to sort of um, take a critical look at what we've collected and, and why over time and, um, and, and uh, think more democratically and, uh, and diversely in that way. Um, by opening Houghton, we can mean a number of other things as well. The lovely building I referred to earlier has its downsides. Its architecture at once provides a remarkably special environment for those who entered. But it's not entirely welcoming, especially when combined with the vestigial cultural issues to which I just referred. Demystifying Houghton, especially for students, represents a core area of focus. We want students to see Houghton as their library and understand the range of opportunities we present. Like many or perhaps all special collections on college and university campuses, Houghton has seen a great growth in classroom visits, tripling the number of classes we've hosted over the past 10 years, and with a 28% increase in the last year alone. It has become common to refer to libraries as teaching laboratories for the humanities, offering a continuum of experiences that range from very short introductions to special collections and our services to hosting entire courses within special collection settings with deep integration of items such as medieval manuscripts into the foundation of the course itself. The staff skills necessary to carry out this mission are not very technical. Instead, we require colleagues with intellectual grounding in the humanities, um, intelligence flexible enough to work with faculty and students from multiple disciplines, an understanding of how to teach research skills using primary sources in archives and increasingly in digital form, and a willingness to engage with students and faculty. The growth in course offerings challenges our facilities as well, which are often not designed to host courses at scale, nor to support student-driven learning. This is certainly true of Houghton and many others. Finally, uh, our teaching mission can also extend in online education. This fall, uh, Harvard X, which is our um, online uh, um, teaching, uh, oh man, I lost it. Um, our MOOC producer at Harvard <laughs> uh, launched a course titled The Book, History Across Time and Space, an interactive learning experience that examines the world of books, scrolls, and manuscripts. Featuring several distinguished Harvard professors, the course highlights aspects of these materials, from their physical structure and history to the print and handwriting found within its pages across time and across cultures. The library was an essential partner in this endeavor, hosting and participating in filming sessions, working with faculty to develop modules, digitizing books and manuscripts, and providing exemplars that illustrate concepts discussed in the course. Our participation in this course represents new ways for libraries and archives to be involved in student learning on campus and throughout the world. Exposing our hidden collection site can be discovered and accessed represents another way of opening a library. Houghton boasts a long tradition of excellence in the areas of cataloging. Several key reference works and bibliographies were created at Houghton Library, and the cataloging methods and, output, and outputs influence generations of catalogers. However, the volume of collecting we have done, along with highly detailed methods for cataloging and archival processing, conspire to create significant backlogs of hidden collections. So as we carry um, our traditions forward, we're also introducing new methods to ensure all of our holdings can meet a baseline of basic discoverability. Opening a library extends to digitizing collections for research, teaching, and enjoyment as well. And we've been digitizing content for years, long enough that we can now speak of traditional digital library work, wherein we digitize materials predominantly visual in nature and present them with individual metadata records and systems that enable both searching and browsing. More mature approaches to digitization in libraries and archives see digitization along a continuum on either side of the traditional library work. One end holds mass digitization of archival collections, which we digitize as quickly as possible with the goal of basic readability. We utilize existing metadata from our finding aids and catalog records with the added advantage that these tools provide valuable context to digitize resources. At Harvard, repositories routinely digitize whole series and collections using these me methods. We're also carrying out a major multi-year project to digitize the university's holdings related to co colonial North America. Though admittedly, the digitization and conservation techniques necessary to work with fragile 17th and 18th century documents are more intensive. 
At the other end of the continuum, we surround digitized content with a much greater degree of interpretive and contextual description created through scholarly engagement. We'd like to move our publications toward an online open access model and along with them provide, web ex provide platforms for web exhibitions and other digital projects that will contribute to scholarship and student learning. While useful, much of the digitization of materials from archives and special collections has been somewhat scattershot and has lacked coherency. And it's our hope that um, some more carefully curated digital projects with scholarly engagement can improve the situation and provide more meaningful online access. Any, any discussion of digital projects must also include Born Digital Archives, and this presents a significant challenge for us at Houghton. As I mentioned, I took a course in electronic records in my second semester at SCI, so I cannot present the set of concerns around Born Digital Archives as at all new. But even though we've made significant progress, Born Digital Archives continue to challenge us in many ways. Progress on our abilities to acquire and preserve Born Digital Holdings has been frustratingly slow in collecting repositories. But the emergence and implementation of digital forensics techniques in the last several years has moved us forward, as have new tools for handling born digital records, such as Stanford's EPAD project for email. While some repositories have developed successful methods for providing access to born digital archives, this is an area where we need greater attention and an understanding that one size does not fit all. Ideally, access systems for born digital archives will allow collections to be accessed remotely over networks and will facilitate searching and browsing of the files themselves. Intellectual property and privacy concerns present barriers to this vision, however, and we've yet to fully uh, work those out. As a field, uh, we're also beginning to face difficult, some difficult issues related to the financial value of born digital archives. While many of our collections come to us via donation, Houghton also regularly purchases collections, especially those of a literary and or artistic nature. The papers of literary figures have enjoyed a robust market with big name authors receiving seven figure sums for their archives. The value of these archives stems not only from their research potential, but also from a tangible connection one can draw between a manuscript, a letter, or a diary back to their creators. We all know that yesterday's letters have largely become today's email, texts, Facebook messages, and the like. Most authors compose on their computer as well, and unpublished manuscripts and drafts of writings are found on writers' hard drives. Though different from their predecessors, these materials have great archival value, but should we be expected to pay the same or any sums for them when they do not and cannot hold the same artifactual value given the lack of originality and our ability, and our ability to reproduce them exactly? I can tell you that authors, their agents, and dealers seem intent on putting an analog cost model on the digital. My own hope is that libraries and archives will manage to resist this movement and work more collaboratively, collaboratively and not competitively on methods to preserve and share digital records of our literary past. We face many other challenges and opportunities related to collections as well as we navigate the new terrain of the information age. As library collecting has begun to focus more on acquiring rare and unique holdings, two concerns arise. I've already mentioned the high prices of literary archives. I'm concerned these prices will create a situation where fewer creators will be willing to donate their collections and that all but a few elite institutions will be able to acquire collections. So I'm coming from one of those institutions and even there I'm, I'm concerned that the prices will outstrip even rich institutions' abilities to acquire. The laws of supply and demand are perhaps at play here, but rising prices present a threat to the preservation of our cultural heritage. While in one sense this presents a problem not widely shared beyond well-endowed and supported libraries, the shifting marketplace imp impacts the profession's ability to preserve a representative archival record. We're also seeing bibliographers and selectors in the general library increasingly focusing on collecting rare and unique content that has traditionally been the province of special collections. This blurring of the lines of collecting can bring extremely positive results, but only if we work out the tricky differences between collecting and stewardship assumptions in the two realms. These are only a few of the major issues we face, and given more time, I, I may have talked about how we would like to expand our support of digital humanities work, introduced improved assessment activities and use of data to support planning and decision making, making and heighten the impact of our exhibitions, especially in the digital realm. A final way to think about opening a library relates to opening ourselves up to better collaboration. All of the activities I discussed above rely both upon Houghton staff and those outside of our walls. Part of how we increase capacity to improve our programs, teaching, and digital initiatives involves inviting others to partner with us on this work. 
While we have never truly been islands unto ourselves, future success in special collections and archives relies upon our ability to collaborate more effectively and likely includes the very difficult work of integrating services and operations. In concluding my remarks this afternoon, I'd like to turn back toward considering the future of UMSI. In the past 20 years, the school has enjoyed great success in incorporating the needs of libraries and archives within the broader framework of the School of Information. There's no future in libraries and archives that doesn't force us to understand the information landscape in the broadest possible way as it continues to evolve and reinvent our services, programs, strategies, and operations accordingly. The spirit of innovation at the heart of what UMSI has become is desperately needed in libraries and archives. I would suggest that the ethics and values of the library and archives profession have an important role to play in the school's future as well. Values such as a diversity to ensure we incorporate different perspectives and viewpoints, welcome and create opportunities for members of groups, of underrepresent members of groups underrepresented in our profession, and preserve a record that reflects our multicultural society in all of its complexities. History and memory remain important values as well. Society of American Archivists states this well in our core value statement. We preserve and provide access to primary sources because they, quote, help us to better comprehend the past, understand the present, and prepare for the future. I've always loved the way librarians and archivists value humility. At times, this humility serves as a barrier that prevents us from advocating for resources and promoting greater awareness of our collections, programs, and services. But recognizing that one does not hold all of the answers allows us to identify areas in need of change and to evolve. And a final value I would impart is the concept of service. I often tell my colleagues that libraries and archives are amazing places to work, but they don't exist so that we can work in them. By saying we value service, I do not mean to suggest a diminished role as a servant, but instead to orient the profession altruistically toward facilitating the use of our collections and resources to improve the lives of our researchers, our institutions, and society itself. These are professional values I'm thankful to have first encountered as a student at the School of Information and in the libraries and archives at the University of Michigan, and which have deepened throughout my professional career, even as we have seen dramatic changes in how we practice our craft. While we remain in a state of seemingly constant transformation, we need to remember that archives and libraries improve the world. In preserving and making available documents, images, and artifact, artifacts, and other records of the past, we help our society remember and learn from its best and worst moments. We spread awareness and understanding of our own and other cultures. We empower individuals, organizations, and communities. We educate new generations of citizens and leaders. We foster creativity. We inspire imagination in the creation of a better future. We must stay true to this mighty mission as we evolve and find new ways to extend the reach and impact of our collections, our services, and our programs.